So the parable in Luke 16. Just to look in general terms at the parable before we come to the matter of hell itself in in uh, this parable we have two characters in verse 19 a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day and then there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores so the rich man evidently very rich living a lavish lifestyle and then Lazarus this beggar who was so ill so weak he needed to be carried to the gate of this rich man and he lay there every day in hope of some crumbs that may have fallen from his table two very very different men well very very different they were in terms of worldly prosperity but both of them died in verse 21 Uh, uh, verse 22 rather it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried Lazarus died this poor wretch of a beggar probably laid if there was such a thing in those days in a pauper's grave having a pauper's burial Whereas the rich man, we can well imagine, would have been buried with no doubt, with great pomp and ceremony, with crowds of admirers around him. Lazarus had been carried to that rich man's gate. Now we read in verse 22 that he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. No more begging there. Lazarus at his funeral, maybe a few friends or sympathisers, but then met and carried by angels who escorted him into the presence of God. Whereas this rich man, escorted to his grave in great pomp, was then dispatched so unceremoniously into hell. Why the different end, the one from the other? Well, clearly the rich man was not condemned simply because he was rich, but rather because he received his good things. He wanted them, he grasped them, he lived for them is the implication. He knew what was good and he grasped all hold of these things. What he did not receive was the grace of God. Lazarus, well we think of him and we have to say that of course heaven was not a compensation for the difficult time he had of things when he was upon earth. But he was carried into Abraham's bosom. Abraham, of course, is the man associated with faith. And to be carried into Abraham's bosom implies, of course, that this poor man, this wretched man, though he had nothing in the world, he had everything in God, he is a man of faith. And faith in the promises of God saw him saved and delivered and brought into heaven to dwell there forever. But in verse 23, there are these most solemn words that this rich man who had died and was buried at the end of verse 22, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. The first thing we must say about the doctrine of hell is that it is most certainly a definite state and a definite place. This rich man died, we're told, and he opened the eyes of his soul, as it were, in a place in which he may never have believed and certainly which he hoped never to see. But there he was, in hell, in hell. Friends, if heaven is real, which it is, hell is real also. If heaven is a place, 
hell is a place. If all Christ's word is true, which it is, that truth includes this doctrine of the state and place that is hell. How many millions of people in this world today who have shunned the things of God, who have deliberately walked away from the gospel of Christ, who have received their good things here in this world, who have indulged all their lusts and all their desires in all that this world has got to offer with never a thought for God and never a thought for their never dying souls, will one day open their eyes in hell. Are you a Christian? Are you a believer? Then thank God that he has opened up, opened up your eyes to see things while you're here in this world. Thank God for what you know. Thank God that he's brought you to believe in a crucified Christ. And thank God that there never will come the day when you open up your eyes in hell. It's a definite place. It's a definite state. And moreover, it's a terrible place and a terrible state. We read there in verse 23 that this man was in torments. In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. That's a very suggestive word in the original. It means something like that the touchstone that's used to in the purification of gold and silver where um, part of the process is where the, the metals sink to the bottom. It became used and associated with the idea of torment or torture and it was ultimately associated with the idea of, of the rack, an instrument of torture being in torments. Verse 24 talks about the flame. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Elsewhere in the New Testament in Matthew 8 we have a reference to hell as being the outer darkness if there is an outer darkness, there is presumably an inner darkness, but the whole of that place and state is darkness, gloom and misery and hopelessness and despair, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And all of these terms are given to us that we might begin to grasp the actual terrors of what hell is. The loss of all joy and all pleasure. The experience of nothing but misery and ruin. You know, people in the world think of, have got strange ideas. It just shows you how the devil has perverted these pure biblical doctrines in the eyes of unbelieving people. They either assume out there in the world that everybody will go to heaven and sadly of course this is a, a fallacy which is confirmed so often in funerals that are conducted presumably by unbelieving vicars and rectors and so forth because according to them people that have never hardly darkened the door of a church are going to be raised up to everlasting life the blind leading the blind they either believe they're going to heaven anyway or they believe that hell is a place of fun where they can enjoy their sins and all their pleasures. There's no enjoyment of anything in hell. A place of darkness and flame and ruin and misery. A place where God makes his wrath felt. Have you ever tried to, to work out what that means? To, to, to feel, to sense, to experience the wrath and the anger of God against sin. Perhaps as a little child, cast our minds back to being a little child and 
parents were angry with us because of our naughtiness. And it wasn't nice, was it, to, to know that somebody's angry with you. Well, I don't know how many times you have to multiply that sort of experience to get to the point where you sense and feel the wrath of God. Untold torment of body and mind, all in the state of utter despair and hopelessness. A terrible place and state. Furthermore, thirdly, it's a permanent place and state. Verse 26, Abraham says to the rich man, or to the man that had been rich, Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. A permanent state, this gulf that is fixed, this great divide, as it were, between heaven on the one hand and hell on the other. Fixed. None would obviously wish to go from heaven into hell. And none can pass from hell into heaven. The Lord spoke in Matthew 25 verse 46 to the effect that these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into life eternal. The punishment of hell is everlasting as heaven is eternal with everlasting life. Hell is eternal with its form of eternal life. <coughs> and so, according to this doctrine, we enter into the one or the other and we never leave. Thank God we shall never leave heaven. But what a thought to never leave hell. This place and state from which no one, no one can ever release. Condemnation to hell is irreversible. No one can relieve you there. There's no bridge from heaven to send relief or comfort. And there certainly is no comfort or relief to be found within hell itself. No one to offer you a second chance. No gospel preaching. No opportunity for repentance or faith. No parole board hearing. You know this kind of a thing that happens to to uh, convicted criminals here in the world. No, well now you've finished your sentence and you may go free. It's everlasting this sentence. And no living in hope of a better day. This awful, awful despair of utter hopelessness. It's terrible now and it will always be like this. That's the doctrine of hell. This permanent place and state. And fourthly, it's a place of consciousness. There's none of this soul sleep at death. There's no annihilation of the soul. The soul upon death is taken from the body and it's taken either into heaven, as is the case for believers, or it's dispatched into hell, as is the case for unbelievers. Consciousness. This whole parable that Jesus taught is about someone who is conscious of what is experienced. He is consciously tormented in verses 23 and 24. In hell he lift up his eyes. Being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, you see, and said, Father Abraham have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. All of the language in those two verses speaks about a soul who is conscious. Conscious of where he is, conscious of what he is experiencing, conscious of heaven that is afar off, a heaven that he cannot attain to, conscious of his hopeless despair and his never-ending suffering. I think it's quite, it's quite a striking thing that the Saviour suggests to us here. This, this idea of seeing Abraham afar off in verse 23. 